and a name, those two words. In, in the Hebrew, the word for memorial is the word yad, which simply means hand. And the word for name is shem. So it's yad vashem. Va is the, means, yet, it means and. So if you go to Israel today and you go to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, that museum is called Yad Vashem because it was based, comes right out of this passage in Isaiah. Yad Vashem, hand and name. And the hand, of course, is, is, is in, in the ancient world uh, symbolic of work, of life. God's right hand is the seat of his power. And ironically, it is also a euphemism for genitalia, believe it or not. So some scholars, she didn't want me to mention this, but some scholars have actually thought buried within this is uh, a sort of a, a ironic message to the castrated one that you're really getting something better. <laughs> you're getting your organs back in a certain way. But a, a name and a memorial, you don't have the physical legacy because you don't have a marriage that produces children. That's what the memorial is, but this is a spiritual one. It's, and, and Isaiah says it's better, better than sons. Well, how can that be? I mean, you might be sitting there thinking that. Well, maybe it's not all for this life, but that's what Isaiah is saying that God is saying here. Well, I, I think it's, you need to get to this, but it, it, the point is you get to have sons and daughters because we produce sons and daughters in the faith through what? Through our witness, when we bring people to Christ. So as single people, you have the opportunity, just like a married couple would have the opportunity, to bring people into the kingdom of God through conversion. You have the opportunity to have dozens or hundreds, as many people you can bring. And God says, the children that you bring into heaven through conversion are much more of a gift and blessing than any children you would bring in through the flesh, through, through marriage, you know. So he says, a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Um, whatever that all means, it's huge and powerful, and it's for you. Uh, that promise is not for Catherine and I. We're married. We're, we're, they're they're going to get something better than us, right? Mm -hmm. According to this. According to this, don't know what it is. Don't know what it is. Uh, my, my, my feeling is there are unique blessings and opportunities for married people, and there are unique blessings Correct. and yeah. opportunity for single people. And the greatness of the de blessing doesn't isn't depend on whether you were married or single. The great blessing. Uh, really depends on how faithful you were to your calling, whether it was as a single person or as a married person such as we are. And I also love the fact that God opens the doors to yes. foreigners, people that are different. You know, this uh, problem still exists, and it existed in Jesus' day. You know how hard it was for the Jewish Christians, the first believers, to let Greek pagan Greeks come in and fellowship with them and how long that took and how many battles Paul had to fight uh, with that. And yet here, 700 years before, God's saying to the people, open the doors of the temple, let the foreigners in, as long as they worship me and, and honor me and follow me, they're as good as you. Well, let's look a little bit at what Jesus says. Um, there's, only, there's very little about this uh, in, in the New Testament, but in Matthew chapter 19. Can, can I just say, it, it was obviously a tough sell because nearly 700 years later when Christ comes on the scene, things hadn't changed much. Not much. But, but it is here. Yeah, uh, in Jesus' time, if you were a rabbinic Jew, a Pharisee, you would have considered it a religious duty and a social duty to get married and have children. And if you didn't, something was wrong with you. That was the world that Jesus was raised in. That was the world that Paul was raised in. And Jesus, in this section, he's talking about divorce and remarriage and so forth. And uh, this is only in Matthew. He says this. He said, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it's given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Obviously, some kind of 
birth defect. Um, some others were made that way by men, so obviously there were still some people practicing castration to make eunuchs. Jews didn't do that. It was happening in the Roman world, for sure, and the Greek world. And then finally, and others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. We don't have a whole lot of explanation. It would have been nice to have Jesus and Paul together to say, could you just fill that in and answer all of our questions about what you mean by this? Um, so obviously we're not talking tonight about birth defects or physical eunuchs. We're talking about the third group that Jesus mentioned, that those who have chosen to be single. Now, a group like us tonight, many of you, some of you would say, well, I am single. I'm not sure I really chose it because uh, maybe I'd like to be married or I am single. I see myself as single for a period, right? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe some of you said, you know, I'm reconciled. I like being single. I, I think this is what God has for me, and that's fine. And it's fine to see yourself as, as in an interim period, and maybe you'll get married at some point in time. Uh, or if you've been married, that you might remarry at some time in the future. Uh, but it seems to say that Jesus, Jesus seems to say there's a valid type of choice to be single that God approves of. And this, to me, is exactly echoing what Isaiah says, that Jesus is affirming this. This kind of comes out of the blue. Because in the rabbinic Jewish mindset, um, it, it just would be unheard of for some 18-year-old uh, male ra or woman raised up in a f Jewish family then to say, you know, I'm just going to be single. I think I want to be single. For the Lord. For the Lord. Yeah, for whatever reason. But for the Lord, they would say, that just doesn't compute. You can't do that. It's not, you know, you're, because it wasn't part of the culture and it wasn't part of their interpretation of the Bible. Um, so Jesus here seems to be affirming singleness as, a, as an equally valid and important way to live as opposed to being married and procreating and having family and so forth. Um, and of course, Paul, Paul comments on this as well. Paul himself, as far as we know, some say that he might have been married at one point. I don't think he was. Um, I think Paul was a uh, religious scholar and, and a zealot, and after his conversion, it's clear that he wasn't married from his conversion on. Whether he had a wife as a Jewish leader, he would have probably expected he would have, and that wife didn't want to, thought he was nuts when he got converted. Well, but I, I would think Paul would have said something about that, because he's pretty transparent. But in 1 Corinthians, he does address singleness, and he, he, does, uh, he doesn't knock marriage, and he, doesn't, he, and he says that, you know, in his opinion, he'd, he'd prefer people to be single, and that's his, but he says, it's my opinion, it's not God speaking, and um, in chapter 7, he, he talks about this, and I'm sure you've heard people talk about these verses before, but he does talk about the fact that... Um, So he says, uh, 29, he teases. He says, what I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. Well, Paul, I think Paul really believed Jesus was going to return very quickly within his life or if not uh, very shortly after. So from now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none, those who mourn as if they did not, those who were happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, uh, and those who use things of this world uh, as if not engrossed in them for this world in its present form is passing away. And I think Paul really thought, you know, things are going to wrap up very quickly. So don't entangle. Uh, and then he said, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of the world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An un unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. 
but a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you. So he's not saying don't get married, but that you may live in a, a right way in undivided devotion uh, to the Lord. And of course, he goes on to say, um, if, if one feels he should marry, then go ahead. So, so Paul isn't saying one or the other, but he as a single man, as a person devoted in, into his calling and ministry, is sharing the advantages that he perceives for himself in being single. And so I think in, in tying this all together, and Catherine, do you have some comment you might want to make at this point? I'm going to sort no, of tie it yet. into the applications. So. We'll get there. Um, so I think maybe we ought to just work through the the concluding points on the right here. Uh, practical mm -hmm. applications. Uh, we, we just had a few points to make about all of this. Um, and I think if you take Isaiah and you take what Jesus says and you take what Paul says, that being single is an acceptable state in the eyes of the Lord, just as acceptable as marriage is. So there's, there's not uh, a there may be downsides to either. I mean, there's pluses and minuses with everything. Uh, but there's no preferred state. I don't think God is saying, I prefer you to get married, because that's the norm. No, I think God is saying each one is acceptable as, as your devotion to God and as your path and the way that you're led. Um, so... Second, the second thing that Paul says is that being single, one of the benefits, it can allow you to be more single-minded in your focus. Now, I know that here in Silicon Valley, sometimes, I mean, I look at my daughter's life. She's single. She lives at home. She works for Apple. She works 58 hours a week. She has no life, right? Not much. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> she has a few friends. She sort of stays at home when she's recovering on Sunday. And to say to her, well, Alexandria, you're single. Uh, you're, you're free and unfettered. You, can, you have much more of an advantage over Catherine and I being married. You have so much uh, ability to serve. And she'd say, what ability? I don't have any time. <laughs> so, uh, so maybe there's counter arguments to that. But at least Paul is saying that if you... Our relief, if you don't have the f responsibility of caring for a spouse and maintaining a family in a marriage, you could fill that with devotion to God and servant service and ministry, as Paul is saying. Practically speaking, it might not be that easy. But, but I think Paul probably would say you're wasting your singleness if you're not using it in ways to serve God in a greater way because to, to him that's the the whole point is the unique opportunities it gives you to do kingdom work and kingdom ministry and and so if you're not taking advantage of that then you're just single for being single and, and that paul would go what's the point you know yeah and you may be single not by choice yeah. i mean that's true too but if you will talk about that still, though still in a in in a situation then it's it's how can i make the best of it um, and the third point of application, and this, this is not true just for singles, but for anybody, mm -hmm. um, is we all need to learn to see ourselves as whole people and complete in God. Um, it can help overcome the feeling that, well, if I just had a spouse or if I just had... And it doesn't have to be that. I mean, married people, if we just had this money or if we just had so-and-so. I mean, Catherine and I have found ourselves with some of the journey our kids have taken and comparing them to some of our friends and saying, you know, why couldn't our kids make the decisions those kids made? You know, why aren't... And, and it's just a rabbit trail down into a dark place. So it really is a, a struggle, a lifelong struggle to allow yourself to, to accept yourself the way God accepts you, to feel I'm, I really am a whole person. Um, and for years in our singles ministries, we always said one is a whole number. 
Yes. One is a whole number. And being single and whole and complete and having that sense that you're a whole person um, can help you overcome the feeling that somehow I'm missing out or somehow if I only had this focusing not so much on what you don't have but what you actually do have and who God is in your life. Um, and then Catherine touched on this. The last point really is the point that Isaiah is making um, is what really lasts. What, what really matters? That's, that's the question I think everybody needs to ask. And uh, it's the deepest question. What, what is it that really matters? Uh, well, the legacy and the memorial that Isaiah talks about is a spiritual one. Uh, it's a relationship with Christ, our service of him that lasts for eternity. And I don't think, you, you know, evidently marriage is for only for this life. Now, right. The Bible doesn't say much about this, but there is that one passage where, they, hey, what happens to, you know, so-and-so died and then his brother married his spouse. And they all